I'm Cindy Kelly. Uh, I'm here in Nagasaki, Japan. Mm -hmm. It's February 19, 2019. And I have with me a distinguished guest. Mm -hmm. I'm asked, please say and spell your name. Okay. My name is Tatsujiro Suzuki, T A T S U J I R O. My last name is Suzuki, S U Z U K I. I, uh, I'm a nuclear engineer, and uh, um, I graduated from uh, University of Tokyo in 1979, and, uh, 1975, and then uh, went to MIT, uh, Technology and Policy Program, majoring in nuclear engineering. But since then, I've been mostly working on uh, the civilian nuclear energy and non-proliferation. That's my academic field. And then uh, I came back to Japan in uh, 1978 and then joined a consulting company. And then after that, I studied energy policy. I went back to MIT again, uh, 1985 to 1995, again studying nuclear energy issues, particularly plutonium issue, which is my field. Plutonium is a uh, byproduct of uh, uh, Civilian nuclear program uh, can be used for both nuclear weapons and also for energy purposes. So it's a uh, sensitive connection between civilian nuclear energy program and nuclear weapons. And I've been working on this plutonium issue for over 40 years now. And <laughs> anyway, and I came back to Japan in 1995 and joined the uh, uh, Central Research Institute of Electric Power Industry, which is a private uh, power industries research institute, mostly working on nuclear energy policy issues. And, and then 2010, I joined the Atomic Energy Commission, the government uh, body who advised the, uh, the government on nuclear energy policy. And then 2011, as you know, we, uh, I had the experience we had experience of a severe nuclear accident at Fukushima. That was my, uh, uh, one of the biggest events in my life and changed my uh, approach to the severe nuclear energy uh, fundamentally. And, uh, and then 2014, I joined uh, uh, Nagasaki University Research Center for Nuclear Weapons Abolition. Uh, since then, I, am, I, live, I live in Nagasaki. Uh, I became a director of the center uh, 2015. So since then, I'm here. At this time, my major uh, research uh, interest in uh, Northeast Asia uh, nuclear issues. And uh, uh, still, I'm working on uh, plutonium issues. And those are two major fields that I'm working on. As a director of the RECNA, uh, we are looking at, uh, uh, again, Northeast Asia weapon issues, Northeast nuclear energy issues, uh, sorry, Northeast nuclear weapon free zone uh, issues as a major uh, target of our research. And also, uh, of course, we are looking at the global nuclear issues, and uh, we are particularly interested in how the the impact of ban treaty on the nuclear energy and also nuclear weapon uh, proliferation issues in the, uh, in the Japanese government and also uh, in a global sense. Uh, uh, we just uh, starting a new project on uh, 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 kind of theoretical study on the alternative ideas to nuclear deterrence doctrine. This is a, a new security study led by uh, our colleague, my colleague, Professor Yoshida. And w one of the group which I'm in is de dealing with the so-called emerging technologies, which is uh, uh, cyber attack or AI, or all these new technologies, how this new technology will impact on the nuclear risk. So this is a new project we just started. I've been working on nuclear energy issues for uh, more than 40 years. I did study on nuclear safety issues, and uh, I believe, I believe that the nuclear uh, uh, light water reactor, particularly the nuclear reactor uh, safety, has been uh, solved. Basically, 
no more serious accident will happen. And even if it happened, uh, probably we can manage the crisis, we can manage the accident. And I believe the Japanese nuclear industry is capable of dealing with the crisis. But I, it never hap, you know, occurred to me that that, that that kind of serious accident will happen in Japan. But anyway, since the accident happened, uh, you know, as an engineer, we, we approach the risk of accident as a kind of probability times uh, consequence. And uh, after the Fukushima, both those criteria are no longer useful. Probability is, is not no longer uh, true. I mean, the very low probability that we assign. The consequence, uh, we, uh, typically we look at the number of deaths per accident. But this time, it, there's no direct death related to radiation yet, but uh, the economic and the social uh, consequence of the accident is so enormous and fundamentally changed my mind regarding how to measure the risk of nuclear power. And it's very difficult to say now that, uh, oh, you can, that may, maybe there's no death related to nuclear accident. But if you go to Fukushima, there are many families who lost their land. Uh, the families are divided over when to return to the city, and many couple were divorced. And some people commit a suicide because their life has changed. They lost their land, jobs, and so on. So the social ethical implication of the nuclear action is, is quite enormous. It's fundamentally changed my mind. Well, I ask you, um, I have read some studies. I'm no expert on this. But there has been some criticism that perhaps the advice given to the um, people was too conservative and uh, in that they overestimated the negative impacts and people were af afraid. They were, there was, m the fear was far greater than the actual risk. risk. And what um, do you think of that? Is, that? is there some validity to that? It, it, yes, if you consider uh, as a group uh, the probably the health consequences of the accident is smaller than people, individual people feel. But the probability of getting a cancer uh, uh, is less relevant to the, each individual person. If you, were, if you were in the town during the accident, and you, even if you were told the probability of you and your children get cancer, it's very, very small, your fear will not disappear. So it's a psychological uh, impact. It's different from the realistic and then probably the actual, actual risk maybe. So the perception that you may get a disease or cancer eventually at any other, any other point in the future, that will change your mind or that will change your life fundamentally. Well, it's interesting because I think we do, scientists, I'm saying now, probably do a poor job of yes. helping people understand relative risk. Yes. Because 25% of us, and yes. the numbers may be going up as we right. are able to escape other forms yes. of death or you know, diseases yes. that cause mortality, yes. uh, cancer is 25% right. in our future. Right. Uh, so it's the excess cancer that you worry about, but Very of course, small. It's hard. Very small. But the thing is, they, they didn't have to worry about those things if there were, if there were no accident. So I th the point is, it is easy to, to tell the story about those realistic you know, probability of risk and so on. But from their perspective, they are the victim of uh, uh, the accident. And even if it's a small, small increase of the risk, which is not necessarily a risk for them. And some of them uh, may have to 
leave the area. And they have lost the uh, uh, land, they have lost their families. It's, it's, uh, it, it is a, it is a serious so social risk. I, I agree with you that uh, uh, eventually they will understand probably uh, the consequence if not that too large. Even for food, for instance, food, food issue is, uh, was seriously uh, overestimated uh, in the, the beginning. But now people think that it's, that, that, that's okay. So eventually they will understand. Well, I think you probably could talk about Chernobyl in the yes. same kind of light. Yes. That there was more death by alcoholism, there were abortions performed because people were afraid they'd have deformed children, and there were all these fears that, that caused people more anguish and more suffering than the reality. Uh, at least that's some of the stories, I mean, again. Yeah, it's, I would say it's not just the radiation fear itself, but it's the kind of feeling of uh, uh, victim. You know, why, why we have to suffer this kind of, uh, um, you know, it's not their fault. And some people argue they, they have you know, received maybe enough compensation in terms of financially, but it's very hard to, um, for them to be satisfied with whatever you receive the money. I mean, this is, this is a, it's a, it's a social, social you know, human rights issue, more or less. It's not a scientific or technical issue. And uh, it, it is difficult. So my point is that uh, if, you want to, if you want to assess the risk of a uh, nuclear accident, uh, it's not just technical analysis. You need those social, ethical, human rights, or whatever. There's non-technical experts should join to assess the impact and see how, how they are different from other uh, risk of energy issue, uh, technologies. And we, unfortunately, Japan has not done that. Only technical assessment has been done, which, is may, which itself is also very uncertain. But uh, uh, what I'm arguing is that uh, after the Fukushima accident, the, when you assess the nuclear risk, you need not only technical experts, but also you know, social, human, individual, uh, ethical uh, question must be evaluated also. So you're talking about assessing impact of an accident in, in those terms, yes. which I think is, well, how would you apply that looking forward? How do you, um, what advice do you have for the government or for um, the industry uh, going forward? Right. Well, I think uh, if, if I chose one word, it's a trust issue. You, you need, uh, you need uh, uh, trust from those people, whatever we do. So the, we are, I'm giving advice. I'm writing a paper on this issue for a long time, uh, but the fundamental, the most significant impact of the accident was loss of public trust. And so as you suggested, uh, we can explain all these scientific evidences but if, if you lose the uh, trust, all these numbers don't mean much for them. So I think the important thing is how you recover the trust between the people and the government and the people and the nuclear industry. Uh, unfortunately, the trust has not been recovered. And the measures the government and the industry ha have taken, they do many, many things, but it's not good enough. Mm -hmm. That's my feeling, yeah. So. Yeah, it is very interesting. Um, but let's say 30, 20, 30 years ago, mm. um, the French government had 80% of its power from nuclear energy. Nuclear. Yeah. And the power plants were commonly located not far from communities. Right. And the power plant companies would invite the community right. for um, candlelight dinners in mm -hmm. the <laughs> open space of the reactor. Mm -hmm. They had school groups go mm -hmm. through the uh, facilities, mm -hmm. you know, time after time. There was a lot of sharing of 
this is who we are, come see us, come mm -hmm. explore the reactor and so forth. So there's a lot of, of um, trust building. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know things have changed in, in France as well with mm -hmm. respect to attitudes, um, but it is a, a challenge globally mm. um, for the industry uh, to repair this. And I hope you have some good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. It, it is, you know, uh, it often happens that uh, uh, when s some serious accident or uh, event happened, and they, which triggered uh, uh, losing the public trust, then uh, you have to change the behavior of the uh, government or industry. You have to change uh, maybe legal institutional change to make sure that uh, the public see that, oh, we have changed. The government has changed. Right. And that hasn't happened in Japan. That's the problem. Uh, so my argument is that uh, uh, when you say you reflect uh, what we have done and we made the mistakes and we have to learn a lesson from the accident, then, then you have to change your behaviors. You have to change your institutions. You have to change your legal. They change only the regulation. But other than that, they haven't done much. Um, for instance, as you said, the dialogue with the public, uh, the way they do is almost the same as before the Fukushima accident. Uh, information uh, disclosure, almost same. Uh, the same institution is working on nuclear uh, issues. I mean, typical is still typical. Uh, so I, I would say that uh, uh, we need a fundamental change. I mean, the nuclear energy policy itself hasn't changed much. At, at the Recuna, uh, our institute right now, our center, does not deal with nuclear uh, uh, civilian nuclear energy much. That, that's my personal work. And, uh, uh, but uh, in its relation to the uh, nuclear proliferation issue, the plutonium and fissile material is my uh, important work, which I'm still working on. And regardless of the future of nuclear energy, uh, we have to deal with this huge amount of plutonium stockpile, 47 tons. Uh, and uh, how to reduce proton stockpile. Is, is, this is not just nuclear energy policy. This is a security issue. This is a non proliferation issue. So at, at the RECNA, this is one of the big issues we are dealing with. And uh, uh, this is not easy. And not only Japan, US, France, UK, and Russia have also a large proton stockpile. And it does not mean uh, they are allowed to do it just because of nuclear weapon countries, they have to also reduce plutonium stockpile. So I'm proposing that they have to work together. Uh, it should be a global uh, kind of co international cooperation scheme to how to reduce the plutonium stockpile. And it is true that the, the, the plutonium stockpile is increasing b due to the civilian reprocessing program. So it does relate to the civilian nuclear programs. And I believe, personally, that the so-called reprocessing, which is to recover the plutonium from nuclear spent fuel, must be phased out eventually. And uh, if you, I, there is no need for uh, plutonium for civilian use at this moment. So uh, and that's, that has a civilian policy, uh, nuclear energy policy implications. But my, at the record, our main focus is how to deal with the fissile materials globally. That's my fear, yeah. yeah. So in, in Japan, the UK, I think France, there's, you do have reprocessing facilities now. Yes. They, they still continue to separate plutonium. And UK, they will, they will stop separating plutonium in the next few years or so. They decided not to uh, continue. Uh, so France, you, France, Japan, Russia, and maybe China, and South Korea is also interested in. So uh, there are only a few number of countries. Uh, although India, Pakistan, uh, they do have a, a reprocessing plan for both military and civilian purposes. 
So it's, it's, uh, uh, they, they sep continue to separate. But the amount of separate uh, is not so large. The France, Japan, uh, Russia could be the, you know, the only three or four countries. So if they work together, we hope they can stop the reprocessing. Yeah, what, now, one of the, the issues for commercial use of, of fuel is that in a reactor you only use a very small percent yes. before it's then, you know, can fit, you know, recycled out or, or removed. Right. And so you're really, you know, throwing away the potential of, right. of extracting more value out of that effort. Um, you know, economically. I mean, there's got to be some. <laughs> there's got to be some solution. Yes, that, that will. We hope. You know, yes. 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 Uh, I, the thing is, the uh, there is a strong commitment by the nuclear industry and the government to continue this nuclear fuel cycle policy. It is. It is difficult to change such a huge institutional. I mean industry and in institution to change the direction. Right. Right. And, but you know, gradually, many countries, you know, phasing out reprocessing, eventually UK will do that. And so I, I hope that the French will realize, I think their reprocessing plant is becoming very old. So uh, if they do not, if they decided not to build a new one, uh, then eventually, their program will phase right. out. But then, then you're left with you know, more and more residual material yeah, in which yeah. to dispose. Yes. And yes. What about, um, I mean, originally during you know, the, uh, the 90s, when yes. we were recovering weapons materials, right. um, they were mixing it to be used in civilian or for, right, right. for Electricity purposes. Right, that was uh, that was easier for the high energy uranium. It, they diluted to every low energy uranium uh -huh. that can be used for uh, commercial right. programs. That has been done, uh, but for plutonium, even if you make it into the uh, commercial field, it's still very expensive. So no utilities are uh, interested in. I see using that, that that process alone is expensive. Expensive, yeah. yeah. So the government have to pay for it. And so it, it, it is expensive uh, operation, but you have to do it. Uh, the United States now currently not using as a commercial fuel, but it's directly disposing plutonium. Uh, but that is also takes some time. So anyway, it, it is a, a both technical and social political issue too. Uh, somebody has to accept. Exactly. Pr pr We've had a little problem in our country. <laughs> yes, yeah, I mean, uh, we, uh, everywhere, probably. <laughs> anyway, so uh, it, it, the disposal of uh, 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 nuclear waste is another big issue, and that, that is related to this plutonium issue, too. We have to dispose, eventually, you have to dispose plutonium in the underground. So somebody has to say, yes, okay, you can put in the plutonium in the. <laughs> Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so that, that's a difficult, uh, again, this is not uh, uh, just one country's program, it's right. a global yeah, yeah. issue too. Yeah, anyway, so that's what I'm working on. Uh, the, the biggest change, you know, biggest uh, change happened in the nuclear field is, of course, the Ban Treaty and also uh, North Korean issue. And uh, uh, we hope that the uh, Japanese government or any other country who are under the nuclear umbrella uh, will rethink its security policy to change their attitudes on nuclear weapons. And nuclear, this ban treaty may change the, the social perception about the, about the benefit of nuclear deterrence. Mm -hmm. And so that we're working on how to we we we're questioning the effectiveness of a nu uh, nuclear deterrence. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the current situation in Northeast Asia, 
Japanese government says we are safe because of the extended nuclear deterrence. Then at the same time, we are afraid of attacks from North Korea. So this proves that uh, nuclear deterrence may work or may not work. So rely on nuclear deterrence will not give you a guarantee of safety. So what's the alternative? And that's what we are trying to uh, develop a theory. Mm -hmm. And also in the reality also, the best way is of course to end the war and the conflict. So uh, uh, I think it's great that the North and South Korea agreed to end the Korean War. And in, now the United States may agree also to end the Korean War. That will change the perception of the obscurity environment quite, a, quite some fundamentally in the Northeast Asia. And so we are hoping that uh, uh, these series of summits lead to a uh, fundamental change of the security environment in Northeast Asia. And hopefully the Korean Peninsula will become nuclear-free uh, zone eventually. Then if Japan can join, uh, the proposal we are making that uh, Japan, North Korea, South Korea can, can declare a nuclear weapon free zone. And then South Korea, I mean China, Russia, United States will provide a negative security assurance to those three countries, then that's our goal, that's our vision. Mm -hmm. And then we don't need nuclear umbrella in theory. And so uh, uh, that will eventually make Japan possible to join the Ban Treaty. And that's our goal, that's our hope, and mm -hmm. that's what we're working on right now. Okay. <laughs> All right, that, that's, that's me. Um, the, another, uh, actually, uh, this is not my field, but as a reckoner, uh, we believe it is, you know, this is a big task for Nagasaki City and Hiroshima City also, how to transfer the experience of Hibakusha to the next generation. And we send every year about eight to ten young students to uh, NPT review conference prep committee, prep com uh, committee conference, uh, they learn by themselves about the nuclear disarmament issues and they try to convey the message from Nagasaki and they face difficulties of understanding each other. So they when come back, they develop their own uh, peace education programs. And this is very important for, uh, for us if you consider the age of uh, Hibakusha. Mm -hmm. uh, I think younger generation, uh, uh, what they have done uh, so far is, is more than we expected. They, uh, they believe that this is not a past issue, that this is a current issue, so that uh, uh, they can work by themselves, not necessarily uh, for the sake of the Hibakusha, but for, for them. Uh, so they develop their own programs to look at the current issues, how to resolve the nuclear uh, issues by themselves. And that's a new uh, type of peace education program. Uh, in the past, peace education program focused on the bomb experience, which is still very important, but that doesn't solve the problem of nuclear disarmament, nuclear proliferation. So I think the peace education should cover wider issues, including history, but also in the future strategy. So that, that's another important thing. And we also develop a, a graduate course, a master's degree on nuclear disarmament and proliferation. And hopefully that will, that will be our, our new uh, uh, generation of experts will come up from the program. And that's another thing we're working on right now. Is this a unique degree program? Are there other? No, it is, it is still part of the social science uh, department. But this is uh, it's a kind of minor measure. You can claim yourself as a uh, minor measure on the nuclear disarmament non proliferation. This is, then this is unique. Uh, it is true that uh, nuclear disarmament and non-prohibition has been 
taught in the context of mostly in the security or international relations. But, but our course is a little bit broad. Uh, we also teach civil and nuclear energy issues oh. and uh, also uh, uh, civil societies, role of civil society and so on. So it's a little bit wider. Uh, so, but anyway, um, nuclear uh, disarmament issue is, is has to be seen again in not in the context of just the international security. Uh, this is human security issues and um, human rights issues. Individual person will be affected by the nuclear bomb. Same as in the case of civilian nuclear energy. If you look at the global, I mean, the number of death or global social risk or whatever, you just don't see the individual person's life. But the impact of nuclear uh, accident or impact of nuclear attack is not just as a group, but each individual has their own life. So we have looked at those in each individual life uh, story. It's very important. Uh, otherwise, you will not see the, uh, the, the story to yourself. I mean, if, if this, these are not the government, the government uh, does that or it, this is a human life issue. And that, would, that is the main approach of the ICANN uh, camp, you know, uh, approach. It's a humanitarian issue. Each individual will be affected by the war and the nuclear uh, war and, and the, even the civilian nuclear accident. So that's one another important aspect that uh, we have to uh, look at on if you discuss the nuclear weapon issues. All the security experts only talk about national security, military security, uh, not discussing each individual's people's life. And so at the record now, we believe that is also important part of our uh, uh, program to deliver uh, uh, how, you, how you look at this nuclear weapon issue as a personal life issue. Uh, that's my connection with the civilian nuclear energy risk discussion too. Uh, nuclear energy experts all, they only talk about energy security and it's a big country as a whole, but they ignore the, the people's life affected by the nuclear accident. But what's also becoming more evident is that global climate change yes. is a reality and, an, and a fearsome one. I mean, the yes. tsunami, the earthquakes, yes. the you know, hurricanes we're having, the droughts, the, anyway, it's clearly upon us, at least um, I would think most scientists believe that. And that should be part of the equation. Sure. That needs to be part of the equation. Because mm -hmm. that's certainly as much impact on people's lives, a yes. potential impact on people's lives, exactly. as yes. the possibility of an eruption of a power plant, and it seems to me, or whatever yes. the worries are. So I think that um, people should look at, you know, at sort of the full picture. Yeah, I agree. Uh, climate change is a serious issue. I've been working on this one, too. Um, you need, uh, this one also is, is not just pure energy policy. This climate change, if you want to deal with the climate change, you have to change the whole social structure, economic structure. The decarbonizing economy is, is a huge task. Uh, you just cannot just say, oh, we build a nuclear power plant or renewable energy and so on. That you, can, you can calculate those you know, uh, energy mix structure, but uh, uh, the fundamental shift to a decarbonizing society is, is much beyond just talking about energy mix. So, for instance, you know, the carbon price is one just where economic, economists always argue that's the best way to do it. But this carbon pricing is basically uh, will change the perception of the, uh, and the behavior of the people's life. After the Fukushima accident, uh, what happened was in Japan, where people just consume 
conserve energy much more aggressively. And it, it's a sudden, it's, in, it's surprising that uh, the energy consumption has not grown after the Fukushima accident. It's just declining. And so uh, the economic structure uh, is changing in Japan because of the, both, of course, the price of fossil fuel goes up, but also the impact of Fukushima. And that, that's very interesting, uh, you know, impact of social change. And, and for climate change also, if you look at the climate change, uh, unless you, you realize this is not the, you cannot achieve the carbon reduction based on the business as usual. You have to change, your, you have to, the global society have to change the whole infrastructure based on non-carbon technology and non-carbon uh, strategy. This is quite a big task. I agree with you that we have to look at this. This is another serious risk we have facing, but people don't see much. And you, you look, but at the same time, uh, again, the, the, the each individual life, as you say, we affected by the uh, climate change also. And so, uh, uh, I, I say. My, my field is energy policy. So I, I look at energy policy uh, on the climate change based on that, you know, how you structure, change the structure of the energy consumption or uh, carbon emission, not just by looking at the uh, particular energy mix. That, that is a very, very difficult to do that. Uh, but, you know, Unfortunately, the energy policy uh, in Japan, at least, uh, is based on the uh, assumption that the economic uh, structure will continue as, as before. Then you, 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 will, you see the increase of electricity demand, increase of energy demand, and uh, an increase of fossil fuel consumption. And they are building still coal power plants. And that has to be changed. In order to change, you have to put the price on the carbon, and you have to, ch you have to create an incentive mechanism to reduce the carbon-based energy. Uh, you need an incentive to live much more efficient life. And so you, you have, the policy has to be changed quite substantially. Otherwise, you cannot achieve. Uh, in the Japanese case, uh, my, our assessment is that uh, probably because of the population decline, uh, energy consumption quite substantially declined. And uh, we can achieve 60% reduction by 2050 or so. But 80% reduction is not achievable. And we need the extra measure to do it. Uh, so um, nuclear power should play an important role in that whole aspect, but, but the, their contribution is probably minor. Uh, you, you got to have, unless you have a fundamental shift in the decarbonizing economy, you cannot achieve. If you want to achieve as a business as usual, you have to build a huge number of renewable energy and nuclear power, which is not difficult, which is very difficult to do it. Unless you change the social structure, it's very difficult to achieve carbon reduction, or 80%, 100%. You have to do that 100% by 2050. Uh, that's very difficult to achieve. That's my thing. Well, it's hard. It, one of the things that um, I think about is the new generation of reactors, mm -hmm. which are um, foolproof, mm -hmm. if you like. Mm -hmm. I mean, modular reactors mm -hmm. that can be installed, yes. buried mm -hmm. 50 feet mm -hmm. below Earth mm -hmm. or 100 feet, whatever, mm -hmm. and that they just consume the fuel mm -hmm. as they uh, operate, mm -hmm. and they might operate as long mm -hmm. as 100 years, and then they're done, mm -hmm. they're buried. This mm -hmm. is, you know, I think a very interesting... Very interesting, yes. Very interesting, mm -hmm. promising approach. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're working on... Yes. You know, mm -hmm. this is a terror power. Terror power, yeah. Uh, right. Bill Gates, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe 20 years out, but... You know, give people time. It could be that there is a new way sure. to 
have yes. safe uh, non-carbon. Safe, uh, safe and uh, innovative nuclear power right. uh, uh, yeah. uh, is certainly a hope. And uh, I will not rule out, of course. And uh, the problem is that uh, uh, those concepts have been uh, proposed more than maybe 30 years. Oh, even that. I think yeah. Edward Teller is one of the oh, people yes. on uh, the patents. Uh, right. the, like the 30s or 40s right. thing. It's, so, it's, uh, I don't know. I, I think... Um, that it is unfortunate. This is a, you know, uh, kind of passive dependence of the technologies. Once you build a big infrastructure based on the existing uh, reactor design, it's very difficult to shift from one to another. And unless you really, as a society, you have to really commit to change your infrastructure. The utility companies, you know, if I talk to the, them, they are, of course, they are waiting for the new reactor to come, but they do not want to give up the existing yeah, technologies. Yeah, right. It's a huge investment. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm hoping, of course, that uh, uh, this innovative reactor will eventually be realized. Uh, we, but we cannot uh, count, count on it. That's uh, my, my point. It is possible energy, I mean, any innovation of energy technology may come up in the next 20, 30 years. And, uh, but we have to assume that may not come. We have to change. I think it's easier uh, to believe, oh, new technology will come up, and though you don't have to change your lifestyle. <laughs> and that optimism may work, and, uh, but may not work. So my, my question is that uh, as a society, as a policy making, as a, as a public policy, we have to, can we rely on those innovation uh, and without changing our current behaviors? And my, my guess is, is the chance is less than 50-50. It, is, it may be true, I mean, carbon capture, you know, storage, or any other innovative technology may come. And, uh, uh, but uh, nuclear, nuclear technology is a very difficult technology. Once you commit it, it's very difficult. You know, I do work, you know, modular reactor concept has been there for a long, long time. And somebody has to prove this is gonna work. And nobody succeeded. So, it may work, it may not work. That's my assumption. Yeah, but there's that, that you know, the terror power. But then there's the more immediate modular reactor, sure. just smaller Small versions reactor. of what yes. we have. It may work. That may work, that they may be more acceptable, that may be more appropriate. May and it, 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 if, if it works, that's great. That's great. Uh, I'm not, of course, against uh, introducing those reactors. But again, you know, uh, and Exxon, Exxon, the utility company, they try the small module reactor and they give up because licensing is so difficult. You have to change the licensing process also. That will change quite significant risk also. Uh, South Africa tried high temperature gas module reactor, which is very promising technology. I like it very much. Uh, I, hope that, I hope that they will succeed and they gave up eventually. Uh, the, it's, it's, again, it's, a, it's not pure technical thing, it's more social infrastructural barriers to introduce new technologies. You know, we have a project on the uh, so-called Global Nexus Initiative, it's a, a nuclear energy institute and a, a center for global partnership, been trying to exactly as you say, trying to develop a strategy to meet the climate change targets. How can we introduce the new innovative technologies uh, in the next 20 years or so? Then you have a list of tasks to be achieved. It's a long list. And one of them, of course, nuclear proliferation. And 
The other is, of course, uh, nuclear waste issue, public trust, economics of nuclear power, uh, and then licensing change. I think the licensing process needs to be changed to accommodate those innovative technologies. It, it is a long list. I mean, it, it does not mean we, we have to give up. Uh, we, should, we should continue to develop, but uh, uh, the time is running out. You know, the critical time period for the climate change is next 30 years until 2050. We have to, we have to reduce carbon emissions uh, uh, quite substantially. Uh, and so I hope that the innovation will come in, in time, and, but I cannot, I cannot, just I cannot rely on it. That, that's my feeling. Right. Yeah. Well, the, the countries whose populations are, are growing, you know, certainly the demand of the existing population for more elect electricity, more power, India and China, yes. they're building uh, nuclear reactors now. Yes. At, at the I hope there will be no accident. I hope not. One, one, one more serious accident, then it's gone. That's it's true. Very, it's very difficult. I mean, China uh, and India have their own uh, safety regulations. And I, I'm not studying, so I can't tell. But it's very difficult. It, I mean, it's, it, it is very important for, for us to work with them to make sure that safety regulation yes. is working effectively. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. Our, our industries depend, or the, <laughs> Japan, the United States, <laughs> the future of them depend on, you know, these new generation, or, or you know, the, the um, Indian and Chinese and, and other countries' right. reactors to be uh, safe and reliable. Right. So I hope, because I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I mean, you know, uh, the, uh, the share of nuclear energy in the global power uh, generation is only 10% right now. And it's not growing. Uh, even if we do with the Chinese and Indians uh, whole nuclear programs, it will, I don't think the IAEA, even IAEA estimate is that the share of nuclear power will go down. Uh, so the contribution of nuclear power on the climate change is important, but it's not. It's not. Uh, uh, it's not on track. It's not to. to um, Take so we have to share, right? yes, we have to think about the, the other measures to right to meet yes. the climate change. Yeah, uh, I think nuclear power is important in, in many countries. I mean, in, in terms of energy mix, but in the global sense, the role of nuclear energy is, is not it's not increasing, and that, that's uh, my 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 unfortunate uh, <laughs> observation. Yeah, um, yeah, huh. for all the reasons you've listed. <laughs> yeah, no, it's tough. It's very tough. Um, well, I know we'll talk more about Ratna. Is there, okay, sure. But is there some, yeah, would you like to, to is there something we haven't, haven't pursued? Um, let's see. Um, let's talk about North Korean issue. I, okay, I think... Uh, the last year's uh, uh, shift, sudden shift of the North Korean strategy uh, is a welcome, of course, sign for us. And the difficulty is, of course, that uh, uh, in the past history t tells us that uh, they can cheat. And so uh, the important thing is how to not to repeat the past mistakes. We think that uh, this time uh, one big difference is that the North, South Korea is, has committed seriously to, to, uh, to end the war to, on the Korean Peninsula. And that will change the perception of North Korea's on the security environment. And if the United States join his ending the Korean War, 
that will be a big difference from the past uh, negotiations. And, but we try to make, make it irreversible, uh, two things. One is, of course, verification. How are you going to verify what the North Korea wants to do? It's not necessarily complete verification, because in reality, there is no complete verification. In any treaty, verification is uh, not perfect. So, but uh, if you have an institutional scheme, legally binding verification scheme, uh, it's harder for North Korea to cheat. Not only for North Korea, but also South Korea, United States, and Japan, if they join together. Any country should uh, be verified. I mean, all the policies and measures have been, if those are taken to proceed this whole denigration process, it, including United States promise must be verified. So verification should work for all parties. So how you design the verification, uh, this whole denuclearization process is, is a big issue. It's very difficult because no any, I mean, there's no international scheme to verify the country who has currently has a nuclear weapon to dismantle. And US and Russia verification is only two countries verification scheme, which is useful to be learned, but it's not the international verification scheme, it does not exist. There's no international verification scheme for the nuclear dismantlement. Once you dismantle nuclear weapons, and once you, uh, the facilities you know, no longer dealing with nuclear weapons, then IAEA can come in as a non-military facility. So IAEA verification scheme is only effective after they declare these are civilian, non-military facilities, non-military nuclear materials. So before that, IAEA cannot verify. So it is, it is difficult. Uh, so we are proposing uh, this is a, uh, has to be a unique verification scheme, including nuclear weapon states and IAEA. Uh, but uh, once you build this scheme, this scheme can be used for ban treaty. The nuclear ban, weapon ban treaty, TPNW, doesn't have any still verification scheme for nuclear disarmament. They say we're going to build a competent authority to, to and then the uh, new additional protocol will, will, will probably uh, will set up the new verification scheme. So there's no firm verification scheme has been established. But if you build this scheme in a regional sense to verify North Korea's nuclear disarmament by step by step, this could be a good model for global verification scheme. So this is a very important area that I'm uh, recognized be interested in. One another issue is, of course, regional uh, peace regime, I would call it. It's, uh, it's not just uh, North Korea's issue, this is Northeast Asia as a whole. We don't have any uh, uh, permanent institution to discuss security issues in, in Northeast Asia. Europe has it. So we should have uh, uh, some kind of permanent uh, institutional scheme to discuss regional security issues so that uh, uh, even the disarmament on uh, conventional weapons can be discussed, or regional territory issues, or uh, historical issues. You know, this bilateral talk is very difficult to solve the problem. So this has to be a multi multinational regional security dialogue framework. Uh, that's another thing we are trying to So propose. that has to involve, would you say, the, the Soviets, the Russians, Russians, and the Chinese, Chinese, and, you know. Oh, yes. Yeah, and the Koreas, and yes. Japan. Yes. Japan also, of course, part right, of it. of course. Uh, so this is the North Asia. There are a lot of issues all entwined. Right. If you bring all those players. Unless we solve those issues, 
you know, uh, going back to the Japan's depending on the extended nuclear deterrence uh, come from those regional security concerns. So North Korea is just part of it. Even North Korea denuclearize, Japan's need on extended nuclear deterrence will continue. So uh, hopefully this regional scheme will be uh, discussed uh, eventually. Uh, and it, again, ending the Korean War will be a good uh, starting subject to discuss this regional scheme. And ending the Korean War cannot be done without this regional talk. Mm -hmm. I mean, not just US, North Korea, and South Korea. We have to involve China, of course. And so uh, that's what we're trying to aim. And so those are key two things. And uh, of course, denuclearization uh, of Korean Peninsula, as I said, hopefully will lead to nuclear weapon free zone in Northeast Asia. And that will make possible for all these uh, non-nuclear weapon states in the region will possibly join the Ban Treaty. And so uh, uh, Rekna uh, has been working on so-called Nagasaki process, which started three years ago to aim at an establishing a nuclear weapon free zone in Northeast Asia, also as well as the peace and security dialogue. Uh, we, we established called Panel on Peace and Security of Northeast Asia, and uh, this will hopefully involve North Koreans uh, as a track to process. And uh, it will take a long time, but hopefully uh, this will be a big group for, for the region to be involved in the whole denuclearization process uh, and eventually leading to the uh, peace regime in the Northeast Asia, hopefully. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Hope so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, the current Japanese government, of course, is not so enthusiastic about the idea. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we keep talking to them. And you never know. Uh, there may be a next election. You, may, you, may, you never know that the, the politics will be always unpredictable. Uh, so uh, uh, even within LDP, maybe some more uh, liberal uh, prime minister may come. Uh, or, you know, the, the Cometo is strongly in favor of nuclear disarmament. So uh, uh, we just keep pushing the government. And, uh, uh, again, also the, the United States may change the president in the next two years. So you never know uh, uh, the politics. So uh, uh, we just hope that uh, continuing and don't, as a non-governmental institution, we have to keep on working on this uh, denuclearization process and eventually change the Japanese policy too, hopefully. I hope Tomo Nagasan will, will speak about that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. You have a. Do you feel that there are a lot of counterparts who are working hard in, in other countries? I mean, obviously, there are 123 or 63 different regions and countries and you know, 7,000 cities that have signed up for Mayors for Peace. Um, but you've got your so interconnected with places like the University of Chicago and MIT and, and other institutions in the United States and I assume Europe, right, that are, are working on nonproliferation and trying to... Yeah, uh, I should have mentioned that my, I am also uh, uh, working as a member of Pugwash. Oh, and uh, Pugwash has been working on this kind of track to process and uh, many uh, countries uh, exports. Uh, those are individual, not the government, but uh, they, have, they have some influence on the government. And I'm gonna go to uh, UK next week to have a Europe 
park wash meeting. And uh, we don't have a still a strong Northeast Asia park wash group. This is a problem. This was a problem, actually. Uh, park wash historically was very strong in Europe and the United States, but not in Northeast Asia. South Asia also. So uh, that's one area, that, you know, one, one thing I, you know, we have already recognized already collaboration with the park wash. Uh, the last two years conference in Moscow uh, was co-organized by the Pugwash, Russian Pugwash, and the international Pugwash also. So hopefully that the Pugwash and the Rekuna can work together. So this is Moscow happened two years ago, it's going to happen? Last year. Last year. Last year, we had a uh, Rekuna meeting, it's called PSNA, the Panel on Peace and Security of North Asia meeting, took place in Moscow. And then North Koreans uh, of the uh, Moscow embassy people came. So we invited them. The last one was before, before Moscow, it was in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. We invited them, they couldn't come. So, uh, but this time, they, at least they sent uh, delegates from uh, embassy. Uh, this year, we don't plan to uh, have a meeting, but uh, we, we instead we're going to have an organized uh, workshop in Seoul with the Sejong Institute. And, uh, so we try to have a more stronger connection with uh, uh, South Korea. And uh, also uh, my colleague Yoshida-san has have a good collaboration with Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington. Uh, so. Uh, it's Can all, uh, uh, you know, non-governmental network of experts who we, we, we try to uh, provide a, a policy advice, theoretical work, and also a connection with the governmental people, and eventually, uh, uh, could be a useful base for the new, new government to adopt the new policies eventually. Uh, uh, the Japanese government, they, they so far, the last three years, they, they, uh, they are tough. They, they strongly uh, are committed to nuclear deterrence. So uh, it, it is hard, but uh, we hope uh, we will develop a new thinking to influence yeah. uh, their policies. I think the uh, uh, TPNW was uh, it, it is a it is a good uh, 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 I think it's going to be a trigger for for the people to change their mind and behaviors on the based on uh, that uh, TPNW. Uh, one in interesting is divestment uh, on the nuclear industry, weapon industry. It, it is it, if just last month, the Mizuho Bank announced that they will not invest in the companies who are associated with the nuclear weapons. That's the first thing for Japanese banks to announce. And uh, that, that would, kind of things, like climate change also. Once you have an international agreement and treaty, that will change the uh, mind of leaders in the private sectors. And hopefully that will put the pressure on the government eventually. Yeah. See what happens. But the public, I don't know, it's a, uh, uh, if you look at the public poll, of course, ma all majority of, uh, are in favor of uh, ban treaty. Uh, Japan should sign the Ban Treaty, but at the same time, they also uh, understand, so-called, the, the current Japanese government policy because of the North Korea and the Chinese threats. So the public also mind is, is divided, and uh, so we have to provide a solution uh, to solve this dilemma, we call nuclear dilemma. That's, that's my... Uh, Work way. I have to. We have to work on those uh, to resolve those uh, people's mind also. Yeah. Well, nothing is ever easy. <laughs> nothing worth doing is ever I know. easy. Uh, of course, it's not <laughs> easy. Uh, but you know, uh, 
the Reagan and Gorbachev almost yes. agreed to, to complete the nuclear disarmament. Okay. So uh, uh, you never know. So hopefully that uh, new leaders will come. And you never know. You never know. You never know. We just turn, keep the world turns on a dime. We you just, no one anticipated the fall of the Berlin Wall I see. and the end of the Cold War. Right. No one anticipated it, and it was sort of an accident. That's true. It was. It was. It's just, I love it. The best kind of accident. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, I love so it. You so you know. just don't know. But I think when the time comes, you know, uh, the policy makers need uh, uh, policies to, to continue to those uh, new... Oh, yes. yes. So we, we should be prepared to provide exactly. those uh, policy. Uh, yeah, you're, you're creating the vision, creating yes. the path forward. Hope so. Hope and, so. and this whole idea of attract to science, uh -huh. collaboration, it's proven... Uh, if you look back through the Cuban Missile Crisis. Right, right. I mean, Khrushchev was getting information about United States capabilities from the scientists who had worked with you know, Pugwash and other similar track to yes. uh, exchanges. And, and that gave you know, both sides, Kennedy and Khrushchev, some um, confidence um, that they had these choices and not those choices. They, you know, they just understood yes. better so it's very important right so hopefully uh, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully it will pay off it will pay off yeah that's great that's great i guess one last question was yes. when you were talking about the verification issues yes and you know with your mit connections yes the uh the treaty between the united states well United States and, and several other partners and Iran. Yes. Um, that it, I thought was a pretty good, yes. uh, a pretty good solid treaty yes. with the verification right. steps spelled out in, in great detail. Right. To what extent? I know it's sort of not on the table right now, but it, is that a possible? Problem? Right. JCPOA is a good uh, reference for us. Definitely, uh, multilateral scheme and it's go beyond IAEA current standardized uh, verification scheme. And uh, it's, it's higher transparency. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Iran doesn't have a nuclear weapon at this moment. So it's much easier. I mean, I see, no, well, they, they were close. <laughs> it's much easier. Yeah, uh, if you have, but, but it is, it is I, I, I agree, uh, uh, J JCPOA was a very good, uh, reference for us yeah. to our North Korean scheme. We can develop the similar uh, verification scheme. It could, it could be a regional one and go beyond the IAEA uh, safeguards. Yeah. And they allow, even allow, the military facility to be inspected uh, by IAEA. So that, that's one good uh, example that yeah. we can draw. That uh, but they, ha they don't have a nuclear weapon, so uh, uh, it's I, I, should, I shouldn't say it's easier, but it is, the North Korea <laughs> is much more difficult because they do have nuclear weapons. How are you going to, when they declare uh, how many nuclear weapons they have, how can we trust? It's very difficult. How can we verify? Almost impossible. Mm. So I think, now even the, you know five nuclear weapons. No one, only the United States, declare exact number of nuclear warheads, and we cannot verify either. So I think that verifying nuclear disarmament is a big challenge. Not only North Korea, but all other countries also, and so the mutual verification is one way to do it. Uh, only nuclear weapon states can verify each other, uh, how, you know, the dismantlement. So that's why so verification of this region, North Korea, if North Korea wants to be trusted, they have to accept China or United States verification, right. inspection. Right, right. Well, maybe it will be the beginning. <laughs> Hope so. Know, hope so. Hope so. Hope so. Hope so. Yes. Yes. That's. Support. I agree. Uh, that's why we we think that uh, uh, 
too much demand on North Korea, so-called complete verification, will change their attitudes and going back to the old, old uh, uh, scheme. So I hope that uh, step by step uh, verification, step by step nuclear dismantlement, is the way to go. Yeah. And I hope people understand that. But the hawkish people don't don't like the idea of a step by step. But even step by step has to be verified very quite, you know, accurate, <laughs> can I say, right. with, the, with the international trust. Otherwise, Absolutely. it's very difficult. So I hope North Korea will accept international verification team. Mm.